Welcome to the Wunderkammer, the place where you will find all the needed objects in order to discover yourself. But be careful, this cabinet of curiosities will uncover things you never wanted to see unveiled. This room will open the abyss of darkness for you. You will see how this darkness will lead you to the light you were searching for all this time. Wunderkammer is excited to be your guide to that light. The cremations don't seem to stop. The spiral keeps taking one after another life again and again. Kitty is standing and watching in disbelief, while the spiral after every cremation centers itself into the dragonfly pond. Now we know that the dragonfly pond has a lot to do with the spiral. So just like every spiral, the entity too has its own center. The next target of the spiral seems to be Kitty's father. Mr. Goshima. If you remember from watching the last part, Mr. Goshima is a potter. Well, now he is a potter of spiral things too. The pots that he used to do are now replaced with weird looking twisted things which have the faces of all the people who previously died because of the spiral addiction. You can clearly see the smoke. You know what's already coming. Supposedly, the organic shapes of the pot take place in the oven where the pots are supposed to dry out. But instead of drying out, they also bend and twist into these shapes. Mr. Goshima doesn't know how this happens too, because the clay has a will of its own, and that's why he calls this the firing effect. Because the shapes are weird and the pots are unpractical, no one buys them at the exhibition in Midoriyamashi. And no one would buy pots with Mr. and Mrs. Saito's faces on them, along with everybody else who had the same fate. And no one understands how these faces made it on the pots and how that was even possible. I don't really know, but ceramics are made from earth and fire. In other words, it's the work of nature. We try our best with human hands, but sometimes nature can create things beyond our imagination. After all, most shapes are really patterns, but we can only see a piece of them at a time. And this made me realize, what if Uzumaki is actually a horror manga where nature itself turns against humans because we need to awaken about something. And I mean, we what we do to nature is trauma itself because it's impossible to hurt nature without hurting ourselves. And we itself come from nature, so we are nature. Then why are we damaging nature? Why are we turning against nature and not taking it into consideration? And ever since I started reading Uzumaki, the spiral reminded me of nature itself because the spiral represents infinity and the spiral itself is something that reminds us of nature and it's its symbol. And let's take a deep look into the spiral as a symbol. So the word spiral comes from the Latin word spirare which means to breathe, as in to expire and inspire. In spirituality, the spiral is seen as a symbol of spiritual development and our identity in the universe. The spiral is present within many cultures such as shamanism, serpent cults, magic, mysticism, ritual art and dance even in history. Here I'm going to quote, As revolution or re-evolution, the spiral progression is symbolic of the transpersonal route to that higher level of consciousness which is sought by all esoteric and occult systems, paralleling these inner movements of the psyche, which indicate the transformative and the integrative are movements in physical space, the vortex or involution representing an opening or reawakening, circumambulatory as utilized in mazes and labyrinths and oscillation, the movement back and forth between dualities, the circumambulatory and oscillative suggest the mandala, a symbol of wholeness, while the spiral and the vortex point to dynamic growth and metamorphosis. Indeed, the spiral vortex is found in whirlpools and water and in the double helix structure of the DNA molecule, just two of myriad examples. 
is nature's favored form for the transmission of its energy, both economically and efficaciously, radiating out and drawing in simultaneously, infinitely, and internally. The spiral is present everywhere, within every religious philosophy. It's present through the Tower of Babel, which was called the Etemenaki, the temple of the foundation of heaven and earth, and you could reach the holy summit by ascending through the so-called seven tiers. The spiral is also present in the Tibetan Buddhism, Shambhala, to be more precise, where it's interpreted as the world center. The spiral is also relevant to the mandala, which is seen as a chart of the progression of the soul and the spiritual journey along the spiral. The spiral is even described by Carl Jung as the upward spiraling of the Kundalini, which symbolizes the urge of realization which pushes a man to be himself. This is referred to the full realization of the self through the natural and universal process of individuation by which the person is formed. This is the journey of completely embracing the self where Jung saw the individuation process as a spiral progression. The spiral is present even in Christianity and Egyptian mythology. So we can clearly see that the spiral is perceived as a symbol of existence itself and self-actualization. And let's see if this can be applied in the, in the analysis of the obsession in Uzumaki. Let's continue with the story. The next day, Kiri is making lunch for Shuichi, who seems like he is enjoying well mentally. Kiri tries to help him by making him eat more healthy food and basically dragging him to her house for dinner. Shuichi is terrified from the dragonfly pond and he doesn't want to be near it. We can clearly see that he develops similar phobia, just like Mrs. Saito before she died. You can see that in the scene where he's triggered the moment he sees spirals in the dish he's eating. We can see a weird moment here where Mr. Goshima intentionally gives the filled plate with spirals to Shuichi as if the spiral is already starting to possess him. He starts talking that his father, Mr. Saito, really understands art, and you can definitely see in Mr. Goshima's eyes that he is walking the same path as him. And it's not as if he himself accidentally uses the weird clay, it actually turns out that he is the one who intentionally uses the clay from the dragonfly pond. I mean, what a shocker. Kitty gets really mad at her father, because of him giving the plate filled with food and spirals to Shuichi, and therefore making him throw up, but she can't do anything about the situation. She continues to witness her father digging and using mud from the dragonfly pond. He would make ordinary vases and pots and put them in the kiln, where they completely change by twisting and forming spiral patterns, and he would forbid his children to go anywhere near the cottage. But Kitty doesn't listen to him, and in the late night, she finds herself staring right in the kiln. What her eyes find is every dead person screaming in agony. She finds many faces twisting from pain. Kitty sees Mrs. Saito's spirit and hears her calling out for Shuichi, her son, to help her get out of this never-ending agony. Kitty stares in disbelief and shock in the same moment when her father wakes up and scolds her out of the cottage but the voices don't seem to stop echoing. Mrs. Saito doesn't stop screaming for Shuichi, even when Kitty gets back in her room. And she isn't the only one listening to those voices. Shuichi hears them as well the moment he calls Kitty. Kitty realizes that her father, Mr. Goshima, never wanted to tell the rest of the family that the same thing happened every single time he started using the clay from the dragonfly pond. Every dead person would burn in the fire while suffering incredible pain, and Kitty doesn't know what to do. But unfortunately, Shuichi hears his mother. He instantly runs into Kitty's house and runs straight towards the kiln. Mr. Goshima tries to stop him, but he fails. Shuichi grabs a brick and destroys the kiln, and with that, he manages to set the tortured souls free once again or so it seems. So the souls basically trapped within the spiral and are actually alive and struggling. And the kiln basically reminded me of hell itself. And these souls surely don't like the fire. And it's very interesting that they are still trapped. And even though Shuichi destroys the kiln, his parents along with the other dead people remain trapped within the spiral in twisted vases. It's as if they can't find peace or a resolve about something. They're still searching for some kind of peace and want to break through something. It's as if their endeavor for fulfillment and perfection still remains. Their suffering comes from the fact that they didn't achieve any state of peace 
and complete their self-actualization yet. It's as if they are still looking for a way in which they will finally achieve this state of completion, of complete integration. They are still uneasy and they are still looking for someone outside of this hell to save them from their internal torture. Shuichi ends up burning down the cottage, but still Mr. Goshima's obsession doesn't seem to stop. And I can guess that what these tortured souls want to get out of is the addiction that leads them towards the spiral. They want to be set free from that addiction. Because that addiction is basically preventing them from that self-actualization process. The next arc is even more tragic. We get acquainted with the story of Kazunori and Yoriko, two lovers who are like Romeo and Juliet. They love each other without any limits, but their families don't want their love to exist. Shuichi notices that the old houses where the two families are living are haunted by the spiral, and he says that they are doomed. Kiri can't accept this reality and she tries to help the rival families. These two families live right next to each other and never stop screaming and fighting. They even scream at each other through the thin walls that separate them. After the two lovers tried everything in order to get the family's approval, Kazunori and Yoriko decide to run away together. They see two snakes intertwine and they see their last hopes in the love that they are making. Shuichi and Kiri try to help them escape, but the situation is so bad that their parents do everything in order to stop these two lovers from living the life they always wanted. The situation gets hopeless no matter where Kazunori and Yoriko run. Their families tear them apart because of their selfish and egotistical reasons. With nowhere else to go, Kazunori and Yoriko decide to intertwine together, forever. The only exit they have is the power of the spiral, which helps them finally run away and live the life they want. With nothing else to do, they decide to use their last resort in order to save themselves from that unbearable powerlessness. Both of them become like a steel wire. They can't be ever broken apart again. This is how twisted our soul gets in many situations because of this unbearable powerlessness, which is the worst state to live in. There is nothing worse than being invisible and not being taken care of by the people on whom you depend on. This is a tragic and accurate reflection of reality where our souls get twisted to the degree where we don't even know how to untwist them back. And that is how they vanish never to be seen again. I truly hope that they found their peace. This is so tragic. This is like our projection of God. And this reminds me of the God we assume and who appears in the moments of biggest desperations and powerlessness. And he gives us that power in those most desperate situations. But then with that freedom, it's as if we become slaves again and we remain powerless to that entity. Is this our definition of God? The spiral really reminds me of how we see God in such a limited perspective. This spiral is like the projection of how we saw God for thousands of years. The spiral does the same thing as the God we see. The spiral gives us something in order to punish us or to take away something from us. And this just proves how many unconscious projections we have taken from our emotionally unavailable parents and literally projected them onto God himself. And the spiral is the accurate projection of the God we think we know and cherish so much. The next chapter, Medusa, leaves me speechless. The spiral turns its attention to Kitty. And this chapter proves some of my assumptions right. You'll find out later in this video. The first event in the chapter is the death of a high school kid who fell off the roof while doing acrobatics. This high schooler is found with a content smile on his face. This is a part of the conversation where Kitty talks about that with her friend Sekino. Oh, I don't know. I understand how he must have felt. You do? It's nice when other people notice you. Don't you think so, Kitty? Well, I don't like sticking out. Really? I do. Lately, I crave it. I want to stand out. I love it when people look at me. Too bad I don't know how to get noticed. I don't want to just cause a fuss. How can I explain it? I want to be seen. Mm. Shuichi knows and claims that the spiral is all about mesmerism and attracting attention towards itself. He claims that the high schooler died because of it and that it sucks things in and therefore attracts the eye towards its center. That's the reason why it's so mesmerizing. 
He claims that everyone who is obsessed with attention is basically obsessed by the spiral. What is very interesting is that the moment when Shuichi tells Kitty that her hair is too long and that she should cut it is actually the moment when she gets obsessed by the spiral. The next day, Kitty notices that everyone is looking at her and she can't find out why until she's asked about her hair. When she looks at it, she notices that her hair is forming into little spirals. She tries to tie it and braid it, but the hair becomes very resistant as if the spiral refuses to stay unseen. Kitty gives up and goes to the hairdressers in order to get her hair cut, but the spiral refuses to lose and it grabs the hairdresser's hands as if it wants to strangle her. The hair becomes like its own being. Every time Kitty tries to cut it, she ends up being choked by her own strands. Her hair becomes so powerful that its spirals begin to mesmerize everyone on its way as if it's sucking them into the curl's beauty. So the spiral doesn't want to be resisted, it doesn't want to be rejected. It's the shadow and dark form of the unconscious ego. The ego takes this form when it doesn't see another way to protect itself and the identity of the person. This is the dark form of the ego that we all have before we bring into the light of the conscious mind. We have the same attitude as the spiral, in fact. We want to be saved by being seen and valued never being opposed or rejected, and we want people to acknowledge us as the absolute truth. When we are being recognized as an absolute truth, we are the safest, because we unconsciously see that state of existence as the ultimate safety. If we are absolute in other people's eyes, we have no danger to face. We would rather choose to be seen as an absolute truth and be wrong than being opposed and being right. We are all possessed by the spiral. And we all have its spirit, and it's a part of us that all of us carry. And the spiral becomes a part of us because we have the unmet need of being safe. If we found a way to feel safe, even when the world resists our truth, our ego wouldn't try to protect us by striving towards its own perfect and absolute form that basically forces its way into being accepted as one and only. And this is basically what the spiral is trying to get through its victims. And you will understand more as we go along with the story together. The spiral creates the environment where no one can defy Kitty, not even authorities. This provokes a lot of envy in Kitty's friend, the one I mentioned before. The envy drives her into inhibiting the same consciousness of the spiral. Well, the spiral takes control over Kitty and forces her to do everything from the place of getting the spiral a bigger audience and more attention, is draining her physical strength and is sucking the life out of her body. The addiction is so strong that the unconscious ego is only satisfied with attention and recognition, even more than the physical needs. There are times where the soul is so dedicated to life that we as a consciousness temporarily forget the physical needs, and this especially happens when we are really dedicated to something that we are doing. And this is the shadow side of the separation between the soul, body, and mind. The biggest examples of this are people like Nikola Tesla, who almost never slept and completely neglected his physical needs such as sleep, food, or hygiene because of his dedication and obsession with his own purpose. The same can be said for Thomas Edison, who even regarded sleep as <laughs> unnecessary and stupid. This is only more proof that the emotional needs come before the physical ones, and that they're the ones reinforcing our physical needs. But it's also possible to completely neglect the physical needs because of an obsession with an emotional one. And this especially happens when a certain part of our consciousness feels an intense fulfillment or emotion is ruling us in the moment. This can be seen with the spiral. When you experience extreme pleasure, you tend to completely disregard the physical self. And this is what happens with the emotional state with Kitty and her friend. It goes to the extent where it sees itself as its own competition. The need for assurance and safety drives the spiral against itself. This is the same energy as Tomi. If you want to understand what I'm talking about, consider watching my video titled The Psychology of Tomi, Analyzing Junjito's Tomi. Her friend sees Kitty as her rival and attacks her. The desperation and thirst makes her friend see her as someone she needs to kill in order to be in the spotlight. This goes to the extent where they both are at the brink of death because of the emotional hunger that gets reflected. Kitty's friend continues with obsessively attacking her while Kitty completely gives up because she feels too much tiredness and powerlessness. Shuichi manages to save Kitty by cutting Sikino's hair and preventing it from strangling Kitty. He goes on to cut Kitty's hair as well. 
and fortunately he succeeds. But there is nobody who helps Sekino. She dies next to a telephone pole where the spiral climbs and chooses to shine, leaving Sekino's body collapse and die from physical desperation. The spiral is shown like a parasite. It possesses the body of the victims and it gets its need met with no care whatsoever about the body of the host. This is tragic. And this is the consciousness of the fear of unsafety, its darkest side, the one that we all have. We are continuing to develop our thoughts and perspectives in part 3. And see you there and thank you so much for watching. Please like this video and subscribe if you like this content or show support by sharing these videos if you find them interesting or helpful. See you there. Did you like the visit in the Wundakama? If you did, please like, subscribe, and share this content if you see it as helpful. Did you also notice the artworks in this video? They're not put accidentally. If you want to understand my philosophical reasons of why I put them in the video, you can become a crow on Patreon. In that tier, I'm posting the paintings and the contacts they have in the video. You can also see them like easter eggs. But only crows can see through the messages because they are messengers themselves. You can also become a raven. In that tier you can ask me for answers and guidance about anything you're curious about and you're going to receive a high quality answer. I also have playlists on Spotify under my name, Katerina Lunas, if you need something to trigger and enhance your emotional experience. Can you hear the footsteps? They're the footsteps of illusion. It's coming. But what are you going to do about it? Accept it? Or do something about it?